my business is lacking is direction and, and outbound prospecting. Keller Williams does a good job. They got a thing called Nucleus. They got a thing called Maps um, Program. The reality of it is, is if if you really kind of read between the lines, they Keller Williams always have a different agenda. They make most of their money, I think, through the Maps Program. The Maps uh, coaches really push their agenda. They don't really try and help you necessarily. So the agenda really is like, here, give, you know, here's the Nucleus training, 80 hours of training. Let's put enough gaps in there so that people don't really know exactly how to execute this tactically. So then they have to do the Maps coaching. And when they do the Maps coaching, first they go fast track, then they go to this program, then they go to that program and they capture them forever, right? Um, which I don't think is the right way to coach, to be honest with you. Sure. Um, almost should be out of your, outside your organization because it should be someone that doesn't have a different agenda necessarily. I mean, their agenda is to make, make money, make you successful, right? Those should, that should be the agenda there. That's where I am on the outbound, um, to create outbound sourcing. I am, Keller Williams has a uh, CRM system called Realnex that they use for the commercial side. It is very clunky and it's extremely slow and difficult to learn and use. I've tried, I've been trying for a while. I, I've given up on it. So I have outsourced a few other CRMs. Client Look seems to be the top one, which I'll probably end up going for. Okay. So, you know, CoStar, Client Look, and Reonomy will be my biggest tools. Obviously I've heard you mention prospecting, which we spend a lot of time dealing with uh, in the program. So that's great. Yep. Uh, and we'll obviously dive a little bit into that today. Other than prospecting, I mean, I obviously heard you talk a little bit about the social media that you want to spend some time on and possibly build out some uh, some systems around. I'll give you a little bit of insights of what's worked for me, for sure. Uh, other than those two specifics, is there anything else that you want to talk about today? I think though that's that's a lot to tackle already. So cool. All right. So let's. Um, all right, let's talk about I, I did uh, I did when I did move over to Keller Williams I did I you know I figured especially for social media marketing that niche would be better so I have been niching into medical office I'm not married to it and uh and so I'm willing to take advice on on that as well if cool. it makes sense and, to uh, niche. medical so what you've been doing just to clarify because I want to talk about social media first because I think that'll be a little bit shorter to talk about and prospect yeah. a longer your niche right now is medical office tenant rep medical well I'm doing tenant rep but what I'd like the niche to be is buyers and sellers Seller. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, so let's do it. Uh, let's do a quick deep dive. Number one, let me talk about some mistakes that I've made with, with social media content. So what I've found to be incredibly beneficial is that because I, I still record a hundred percent of my own content, I have my own setup. I record in front of my camera. I then upload all the content and my team handles hundred percent from there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind that two things, my, my biggest make the mistake that I made was not delegating soon enough because it's obviously a lot of work for one person to handle. So delegating somebody to edit your content or even just post your content, whatever's faster for you to focus on. Like if you're using AI to maybe, you, you know, use some of the AI programs that chops up longer form content, which I'll talk about in, in a second here. And then you have somebody post it. I think that might work or you even have somebody that just uploads it to those softwares chops it up, uses the best one and just posts it from there. So just keep in mind that there's two sides of this. I would spend your one hour a week. I would even say to um, do maybe 30 hour, uh, th sorry, 30 minutes a week, most weeks. And then all that 30 minutes is just working on what content and the scripting. And then mm -hmm. one day a month, you spend three or four hours recording would be the best way to do it. Because one hour, because I would basically say that Take all your time that you're gonna to allocate to social media, which you should be doing, and just realize it's a very long time horizon, and spend all that energy and effort creating great long form content. Because that's very niche, very niche, very high quality long form content. Okay, and long form, by the way, is anywhere between 10 minutes and two hours. And what a really good thing that I've seen people do that I, I've seen a lot of success with is interviewing your niche client, your specific clientele that you wanna do business with, interview mm -hmm. them on a podcast and just understand their world, interview them. And that could be one type of piece of content that you do along with another. And then you can chop up that long form and create short form content from it. Cause I, I made the mistake of my content not being ultra niche to begin with. And uh, trying to record every week was also very difficult. But I've realized is that I'm very good if you just give me four hours once a month, I can block off, you know, let's just say one evening from five to nine. I do all my content that one day it's done. I don't gotta think about it for another 30 days, you know? And then yeah. I would even say, 
I recommend that you stack even like your first 90 days, you do like two, four hour sessions a month for your first 90 days. So it's backlog so that by your fourth month, you don't have to think about it that much. And you could just do one, one block. This way you're backlogged because the, the worst feeling ever is feeling like I'm, I don't have enough content. Uh, so one of the things that I've been working on with the AI is one uh, AI avatars, AI B-roll um, and AI posting. I'm taking it step by step because I'm creating the content first. I've created my avatar. I'm creating a content that can be uploaded to an avatar. The next Next step is probably going to be creating the content, uploading to an avatar, having a B-roll. And now these are all different apps, but there are workflows like Zapier that I can utilize to do that. And then the third aspect of that will be then that being posted automatically. And then I'll go backtrack and figure out how I can start creating some of that content also through AI essentially. But I don't think that it would necessarily get to that point. I'll still have to create the content for it to yeah. be the right quality I want. I mean, look, um, I, I definitely like the idea of using AI as much as you possibly can. I think it's incredibly lucrative. And keep in mind that it's not going to, you're not going to AI your way to doing a podcast with a client, right? Like, you know, there's, no, that, there's that's something I would, yeah. But I can, I mean, then I can use the AI to chop that up at least. Yeah. So like the long term, yeah, the long term content, you're you're right. I won't be able to I, only the short term for consistency. Can I do the AI stuff? And and then eventually, I mean, you know, hopefully this is like a means to an end. Hopefully I can afford a team to edit and do do it a bit better, do those recordings and stuff like that. And, and, and but, editing also just keep in mind that like getting a VA editor, I mean, not not that they're going to be unbelievable because I have some I have very good editors, but it takes us a long time to to get to that point. Like we've built a very good team over time, but I've been doing this almost 10 years. You know, the content, the content game is a long game, right? So your first editor or you end up hiring might not be spectacular, you know, and then eventually they start learning and learning and over time, you, you know, you get possibly better and better VAs. So I wouldn't obsess over the, the quality of the editing right off the bat. I would just get into a very good routine of recording, getting good content recorded and obviously putting it out there. Just keep in mind that like, obviously it's, it's taken us three years to go to 16, nearly 16,000 subscribers on YouTube. And as much as it's gotten us here, like the only way, like we've put out almost a thousand pieces of content to get here. So it's a very long game. I'm looking at this and like, and also like my mindset's like, I'm gonna do this for the next 20 years, right? Like it's just, I'm gonna keep posting. And I know that every now and again, I'll have one video of, you know, per 500 or a thousand videos that'll do unbelievable. And that's just, that's just it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's my piece of social media. So let's dive into some, um, some prospecting ideas here. So I'm gonna open up Reonomy for you um, real fast. One second. On Reonomy, obviously we go into a quick advanced search. What town, uh, what state are you in? Arizona. So we go into Arizona. Obviously we're gonna go to medical office. In the entire state of Arizona, through Reonomy only, you only have 2,648 properties. Now obviously you can probably go into, you know, medical condos uh, as well. But what I like to try to look at is like, okay, let's just say we do $15,000 in taxes at a bare minimum. Obviously you have to go to owners where they have an, inc they include a phone number. This is the one thing I like to talk about that might be a little against the grain is the fact that you only have 831 properties in the entire state to prospect through Reonomy. And this is like the entirety of every single number, right? Like this doesn't even include, I mean, you know, this includes not within, let's just say properties that haven't sold in the last two years, I'll exclude this. So you only have 733 properties to really prospect. My average sales guy makes 400, 800 calls a day. You're going to go through 733 properties very fast. So one thing I would just keep in mind, obviously medical office can be one, it can be a great niche. I definitely would probably select maybe one, uh, maybe one other asset class to be targeting as well, just because this is not going to be sustainable to build any type of long-term sizable business. Cause like, so I, should I, should I even spend, I mean, like, here's my, my thought is okay. Well, for marketing wise, networking wise, social media, it makes sense to niche cold calling wise. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Should I even, should I even niche down? Should I just go after Arizona? What, okay. So you're with Keller Williams. I mean, look, I, I think that you have a higher likelihood of do, of being, of creating opportunity that can be financially fruitful if you do one of two things either for the state of arizona we choose a slightly different niche or you have to go bigger than just the state of arizona and possibly go nationally obviously look medical office is still fairly lucrative i mean there's obviously you know uh definitely some decent value there i also think that medical office has some major pros and cons i think there's an opportunity for you to niche there if you you know if you deeply understand it and you can go nationally. I think there's some opportunity there. If you still want to stick to Arizona and think that that's probably the most lucrative option, which I think to start, it probably is smarter to just go whatever's in Arizona. I probably would just say, let's focus on a different asset class because medical office on an annual basis in Arizona, I'll even get rid of a phone number here, 51 sales in the last 12 months. It's like, 
in the entire state, mind you. Now, obviously, this is this is Rihanna. I mean, maybe I'll get rid of the taxes. You know, I don't know how that really drastically affects it, but fine. 378 sales in the last 12 months. I mean, still, let me go out of here. Yeah, 5,500 5, properties. And the fact that actually there was such a turnover in less, you know, actually, this is actually kind of insane. I mean, the, a lot of these prices, though, let's see how many have traded in the last year. Uh, 133 of them have traded for nothing uh, or not really recorded or they transfer a title 14 of them under and 250 yeah because like i'm trying to keep you in this range of like a million to 10 million like i want to yeah. i want you to be in a decent price range and there's only what 77 plus 28 let's uh, here let's just let's move these you got 120 properties that sold in the last 12 months that that are anywhere in this in this price range right so if you were to get one percent market share on an annual basis you're talking about a 1.2 sales so I, I probably would say instead of medical office is there any other asset class that you feel like you have some viability i mean nothing seems big enough to have well, let's see here. I mean, industrial is 481, multifamily 331. And again, I'm doing all sales above a million. So there's no, I mean, if multifamily, or not multifamily, medical office was more, I see it being a, a very long-term asset class where we're probably not going to see huge dips and, and peaks and stuff in it. You know, it's going to be pretty level. And that's one of the biggest reasons I chose it. But there's no knowledge base that I have a competitive advantage in medical office obviously saw a lot of the brokers that are in it i actually see their parents or doctors or something like that so they do have a leg up so there's not certain not necessarily i mean i've been in the automotive industry i've been in recruitment industry i've never been in restaurant or hotels or anything like, like that so uh, i don't know if there's necessarily any knowledge leverage that i've got yeah i, I think that in arizona yeah. you're probably going to do pretty well with either the retail industrial or multifamily world those three asset classes i think do very very well um, and will continue to do very well for the foreseeable future. Retail, I'm probably better geared towards only because of my, you know, analytical ma management consulting business background where I can, you know, understand multiple types of businesses in right. that sense, because that, that may, plays a big difference, you know, in office, it doesn't really matter. It's just the layout configurations, the type of business and where they're located is less likely to be, you know, a, an issue. Whereas retail, I can speak intelligently to like what business issues I, I would see. I already kind of feel a little bit better about you having at least a 16,000 person list to go after here in Arizona. I think you have a little bit higher of a likelihood of doing, you know, even if you only got, let's just say, you know, there was 928 sales. I mean, I mean, like, you know, even if you got a, you know, 1% market share, you're still looking at about 10 transactions, a little bit more of okay. an opportunity, right? And obviously things are slow now, right? So in the last yeah. two years, where are we at? Yeah, a little over a thousand. So. Anyways, this right. gives you a good idea of like, you know, I, I, I think there's a little bit more viability, um, you know, doing decent here. So retail would probably be, at least in my opinion, probably a little bit smarter for the time being. Um, that works for me. So, and basically what I would do is I would come in here and I would start off with, uh, not within, let's say the last five years. And then I would do sales that have been like, I know the first list I would pull would be like something like this, like something where everything that has traded sub 50 bucks a foot, the taxes are minimum, let's just say 15,000 bucks. This would be a decent list to start. Retail obviously includes a phone number, properties that have sold not in the last five years. So this is 19, 2019 and before, minimum mm -hmm. tax amount of 15 grand. Like this piece is gonna be the most crucial, right? So all these properties, when they did sell, they bought it for less than $50 a square foot. So this is gonna be obviously in Arizona, you know, in most areas, you know, that's very cheap. Right. This is gonna give you a good opportunity to make, uh, hopefully try to find some people, people with a lot of equity. So that'd probably be the first list I pull, and then you can probably scale it, you know, scale it out. Maybe you can go down to 10K in taxes. I really don't know if going less than 8K in taxes in Arizona is any, you know, worth much because then you start getting into like eight hundred thousand square uh, thousand dollar properties it's just a little too cheap is my point yeah they're sure they're like, they might be a little bit easier to you know fasting to close but you get two points on an eight hundred thousand dollar sale versus you know five or six points on a six million dollar sale you know it's like which is why i try to say like hey try to prospect in the million to 10 million range there's probably enough there enough, uh for you to i'm gonna try to you know try to get you as fast as possible to the you know the eight to twelve sales a year at a you know, two to five, you know, two to $8 million range of sale where you can try to average four to 6% per deal, you know, you know you're know, you starting to make a pretty healthy amount of money. So anyways, this would probably be the first list. If you're going through Reonomy, you know, or if you want to take a screenshot, I mean, obviously this is recorded, you'll see it, but I would take a picture of this. This is, these are the filters I'd probably start with. You get a thousand properties to start anyways, as an export, I'd probably start here. So then let's talk about next steps. Now you, let's just say you exported this list and now you're going to go through it. Okay, so the difference here, so that was under the properties tab originally that you just saw. Yeah. Now you're going to go to the owner's tab. 
This is when you're trying to find buyers. Let's just say you found a lead, one, two, three, Main Street, wants to sell their property, they're open to hearing an offer. Okay, all you're gonna do is that you're just gonna open up the search of exactly like you had it before, 15,000 taxes, shopping center, has a phone number, all the same things we just did. Give it a second to load. What's gonna come up here is it's gonna come up with all of the purchasers, all the owners, and sort them in how many, pro who owns the most property, who owns the most expensive property, how many properties do they own in the in the um, in this search criteria? So this is going to give you the best idea of who your buyers are going to be, right? The most active players in your marketplace, and this is going to be essentially where you're going to look and say, I want to be friends with these top 100. These top 100 guys need to be your best friend, and maybe you, okay. choose, you end up becoming close with maybe five to ten of them throughout your career. But those people are going to make your, like, this is going to make your business. We're going to try to find some non, non Walmart. So we're going to actually just do one more thing here. We're going to go to owner. I'm just going to do person instead of company. Okay. I'd also look at like, so these top 15 as an example, right? What stands out to me is like this guy, Michael, okay. Has $78 million worth of property in this area. Michael has 10 properties in this search, 18 total properties worth $78 million. His last acquisition was in March of 2023. This guy is all, you know, Laura, very interesting right here. This has 10 properties in your search, 28 properties in her portfolio for 60 million. They bought something in 2024. You know, I'd go through a few of these February, 2024, $10 million worth of real estate, right? I would kind of fly through this and only like, and, and make note of the ones in 2024, right? This person owns $43 million worth of property, just bought something. I mean, obviously Jeffrey would be a nice person to speak to as $700 million worth of real estate, um, but hasn't bought something since 2022. You know, a lot of these people uh, would try to see like who your active people are, who you're not active people are, right? These people haven't bought something since April of 2020, uh, 2014. This person might sell something. You know, this is obviously last acquisition state and you can kind of see what their portfolio looks like. So, you know, this person has 55% office, 20% uh, mixed use or regular, uh, you know, this is kind of like they, they haven't really, it could be anything. <laughs> They haven't general. They haven't specifically mentioned, uh, you know, niched down as to what it is yet. That's just around me's, you know, uh, mix of understanding. But you can kind of see like what their portfolio looks like. Um, you know, this one's multifamily, so you can see that this person uh, owns nine million dollars, but a large portion of that's multifamily. Pink is industrial, so you can kind of see that these people have, you know, obviously a number of properties, which they probably are. I mean, they have the same last name, I'm imagining, or related, same property, uh, same you know ownership. But they haven't bought something since 2021, and they have a pretty uh, diverse portfolio. Anyways, this is like a really quick, simple way to find your buyers, and you can even get super niche. What's your county that you live in? Maricopa. Everything here, and this is just Maricopa County. So this will give you even more niche of an understanding of like who owns the most stuff in Maricopa County. This, these people own 12 properties in Maricopa County. And obviously it seems like Maricopa is probably one of the more popular counties to have a lot more of this type of product. But this is like a really simple, because everyone always goes like, oh, I can't find a buyer for my property. Well, these are the, like, I would know every single person on probably anyone with three plus properties in your marketplace. I mean, even just take the top 50, I would call all of them. These are, this mm -hmm. is who you're prospecting for. If you're wondering who's going to buy a property when you find it in your marketplace, this is it. You don't have to overthink that. Now it's just a matter of, you know, going back to the properties, pulling these lead lists and just hitting the phone. But keep in mind, like these guys are not going to, these are not sellers or at least the large right. percentage of them. So the script is different and that's the, the foundation really get the buyers. I get like two or three buyers essentially. Then it's attacking the sellers and finding off market Correct. properties for these buyers essentially. Correct. And, and keep in mind that like, I even like to, let's just say you're prospecting for sellers. A large portion of what we talk about is also uh, keeping in mind that it's understanding the pivot. Right. So you're making a call for a seller and they're not interested in selling. What do you do? So you can see if they're looking to, to purchase anything, Correct. increase their portfolio. No. Right. Like I want to spend as much time as I possibly can on my highest and best use. So it's like, okay, if this individual is not going to sell, I'm not here to force you to sell and like force you in a corner and make you do something you don't want to do. It's more so right. something like, Hey, like, what do you want to do? What are your goals and how can I support you in accomplishing it? Anyways, this is a, you know, obviously pretty basic overview of like the step-by-step -step for prospecting where you're going to find what, do you have any specific questions for, uh, for clarification purposes? Cause obviously I know we have the training tomorrow. You can obviously bring any and all questions you might have from tomorrow's training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, what do you, what is, what do you think I should be doing right now? I've been listening into some of the phone calls that you've done the cold calling. Um, I got to do the underwriting training, the other, the, uh, the whatever the trainings are that are in the courses. I got to go through all of those and start doing those. What, you know, is there, if you were to say, okay, here are the steps that you got to do, go to all the calls, obviously all the trainings, 
go through all the courses, right? Yep. Is there anything else that you would recommend or? hundred percent. Yeah. So every single day I'd recommend being on the phone for as long as it takes to generate two leads a day, two seller leads a day, two interested individuals who would like to sell their property per day. And some days that's going to be 30 minutes. And then some days it's going to be seven hours, uh, two leads per day minimum, and then try to get one offer per day. That's your two minimum metrics. And obviously it might take you some time to build up to that point, but I like to just like, I want to set a standard for you differently than you've heard in the past. Yeah. You want to generate two leads a day and try to get one offer every single day. Okay. It's going to be very important. And that means you call up one of these buyers and try to get an offer on one of the properties you generated today. And then if you really sense. follow that religiously, that alone will take you to a different level in the business. That makes sense. And are you meeting, like I've seen obviously the, a lot of the cold calling and stuff. Are you trying to meet with these people? Like is your, is part of the process trying to meet with them in person or is it just trying to, you know, just, if we can do it all on the phone, great. I mean, look, I live in Miami. The short story is that I don't go to meet anybody. However, I obviously see the value in going to meet certain people. Uh, it just isn't me at this point in time in my career. My team goes to meet them. So there is obviously value in doing so. However, it's for the people who are interested in selling and you actually have a buyer who's interested in buying. Those people, I will spend the time, energy, and effort going to meet them, shake their hand, go tour the property with my buyer. Like, of course. We call somebody up who wants $7 million for a $2 million retail property. What are you doing? Right. Just wasting your time and, you know? and technically not really trying to get listings right this is really just trying to match buyers and sellers yeah and like look listing i i don't like the idea of trying to list a property for sale because my the reason why is because if i go to a seller and i say hey i would like to list your property what i'm saying to you is i don't have buyers for your property right. and i'm relying on the rest of the marketplace to do so if i have a buyer i'm gonna bring you a buyer Sure, I might need you to sign an exclusive, but I'm not putting it up on CoStar and LoopNet and hoping and praying someone's got somebody for you. I'll only do that if I know I don't have somebody. And I'll be clear. Be like, listen, I put it in front of every single one of my buyers. They all want X, Y, and Z. This is where they're at. You want this. And we're going to see if we can get you better numbers. And if you're open to doing it, cool. Right. And there's a lot of resources associated with the listing, cost and time and brochures and all that crap that need to be done. So you're exactly. cutting that and out. They're only going to blame you if it doesn't sell. So that's why I try to set up a very high expectation day one.